Let me take you then to these last three or four verses of Galatians chapter 3. Marvellous verses as Paul continues to drive home this great truth that when you come to faith in Christ as Abraham did, you are indeed righteous, a child of God. I've titled my sermon this morning, God's Own People. God's Own People. We live in a part of the world, Yorkshire, where the local inhabitants are prone to call it God's own country. They're, they're proud of it, aren't they? And you might be included in that number as you listen here this morning. God's own country, populated by God's own people. Where is that now? Well, if I've understood the Apostle Paul, He's talking about a community of people that is spread throughout the world. We are God's own people. And what we need is to understand our standing in Christ because it makes all the difference to how you cope with the madness of life. Heirs of heaven, joint heirs with Christ. We've been written in to the will of the Saviour. And in due time, when that will is read aloud at the end of the ages, you and I will be there as the benefactors. I wonder if it's ever really sunk in. God's own people. There are three things in these three, four verses which would help us to understand an aspect of it. Not every aspect, but at least these three things. God's own people have put on Christ, are all one in Christ Jesus, and are heirs with Christ. I could have said Abraham, but it's actually with Christ of all the promises that God has made. You and I are the sole benefactors of all Jesus Christ did on Calvary. Let me take you then to the passage and two verses together. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Have put on Christ. It's a metaphor, of course. But it's a metaphor designed to help us understand that when we believe in Jesus Christ as our saviour, not only have our sins been forgiven, not only are we now declared righteous as children of God, we are included in all the promises that the Father made to the Son. And we have a part in that as joint heirs with Christ. Most Christians would readily understand that we've all entered into the benefits of Jesus' life and death and resurrection. We rejoice, do we not, that our sins are forgiven, that God has taken away the record and destroyed it forever. Or to use the language of the previous verses, we rejoice that we're no longer caught up in the net of sin. We're no longer in prison condemned by the law. We're no longer under the control of a tutor who wants to make sure we grow up properly. You and I as Christians are matured sons and daughters of God in Christ. For that's the position of every true believer. I'll show you more in a minute. This is only one of the many places in the Bible that asks us to consider ourselves as such. Asks us to recognize the, the, the breadth and the width and the height and the depth of God's love in Christ. Whereby he's not only delivered us from a bad past. He's given us grace for the present and promises for the future. Because we are his children. And I think one of the things that Christians need to work on is understanding that for themselves. Depending on your temperament, your health, your circumstances. Life can become quite gloomy, can't it? And then there are other people who are always cheerful all the time. It's, it's something built into them. That's not what we're talking about. Some of the saints of God, I just read Samuel Rutherford this morning, 
who spent all those years in a damp prison in Aberdeen for the gospel. And how he described that damp prison as Christ's palace. For it was there he met regularly with his saviour as he was excluded from his congregation way down in Dumfrieshire. Dear friends, we, you and I need to understand afresh, and may the, the Lord use these words this morning to help us understand the, the, the incredible standing we have with God and then to live in it. The hymn we sang, Why Should the Children of a King Go Mourning All Their Days? always strikes me. I know the rest of the words go in a different direction, but those two lines come to my mind regularly. Circumstances might make you gloomy at times, but that's not a place to stay. And I'm not asking you to simply pull yourself together. What I'm asking you to do is to see yourself through the lens of Scripture, as this passage now describes us, as those who have been baptized into Christ and have put on Christ. It's a great privilege to be a Christian. And I need to be conscious of it. Not because I need to do things differently. But because I am now different. I am not that old man. Who, who was alive before I was converted in 1970. I'm a new creature in Christ. And there's been a lifetime of work. And it's not finished yet. But as I look at who I am in Christ, I find the confidence and the boldness to go forward. And this, dear friends, is the beauty of the gospel. And this is why the apostle Paul has got himself all worked up with these Galatians. Because he's suggesting to people that they're not good enough and that they need to work on it themselves to improve themselves in this circumstance by circumcision and other religious rituals. And in, in, in our generation by a whole breadth of different things that you need to do. No, Jesus did it. It's ours now and will be fully revealed in glory. Ephesians 1.5, he has predestined us to adoption as sons by Christ Jesus to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us acceptable in the beloved. Acceptable to whom? To God in Christ. The beloved. Oh, that the Holy Spirit would drive this into your heart and mind. That before you go from this place today, you, you will be raised up into that heavenly confidence. First John chapter 3 verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. Do you know how it goes on? That we should be called the children of God. That we should be included in this number of privileged people in the world. Sometimes the man in the street looks at people of privilege with jealousy. And you may even have done it. Why should they have all the different benefits? And you like them. I don't advocate becoming proud and boastful. But dear friends, there should be and there is to be a, a confidence about us, not based on who we are or what we've accomplished, but completely and entirely on because of what Jesus has done. Notice again what the scripture says. You are, and I like to point out sometimes the, the tense of the verb. Are is a present tense. It's not will be or have been. You are. Ah, and remember who Paul is addressing. He's addressing the churches in southern Turkey or Galatia, as it's called here. And he's talking to every Tom, Dick and Harry who's a member or who's in Christ as a believer. And he wants all of them to understand that there's nothing more to do to gain God's favor. You are all. 
That's again a lovely inclusive word, isn't it? Every believer, you are all sons of God. How did I become a son of God? Through faith in Christ Jesus. By believing that Jesus Christ died for me. By believing that in his resurrection he announced to the, the universe that God had accepted his sacrifice in the place of everyone who believes. And because of that, I am now in Christ. I was once dead in my trespasses and sins. I was once oblivious to these things of God. But God in his mercy and grace woke me up. The process can be different for every individual. But the end is always the same. Faith in Christ. Believing that he is who he claims to be. That he did what he says he did. That it effected what he says it effected. And that it contains for us not just a religious life now. But a, a life in the presence of God forever and ever. The Bible uses the language of adoption. We have been not only saved to be sort of the, the, the people on the sidelines. I was just thinking JWs have that concept, don't they? They have the 144,000 who are sons. And then they have the great crowd who are just the, the workers and labourers. That's not biblical. But it is a, a picture of how we think. I'm not good enough. That's true, by the way. But it was never based on whether you were good enough or whether you had done enough. The whole record of Scripture is given so that we might be delivered from ever, forever from all the delusions that human beings can ever climb into God's presence. And then the glory that the Son of God came down here to take us for himself. Look back at verse 21. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. It's the next part I want to underline. For if there had been a law given which could have given life. That tells me there never has been any other way to come into God's presence. And Paul's argument that that was true even for Abraham who saw Jesus' day and rejoiced. He was glad. There's only one way to come in to the power of the gospel and the privileges of being a child of God. John MacArthur writes, believers through faith in Jesus Christ have come of age as God's children. Thus, they are no longer under the tutelage of the law, although they are still obliged to obey God's holy and unchanging righteous standards, which are now given authority in the new covenant. We are no longer obliged to do certain things to gain God's favor. Jesus did that in our place. But as a result, we want, will want to live to please him. Romans 8 says in verse 3, for what the law could not do. It's amazing how often the New Testament talks like that, isn't it? For what the law could not do. And yet so many people think if they stick by the Ten Commandments, that they'll be okay. I never get past the first one. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak. What was it? There was something wrong with the law? No. Listen to the verse. In that it was weak through the flesh. That tells me that human flesh, you and I, could never comply. What the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. How did you do it? By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. Now listen to what it goes on to say. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. We do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. 
Get a picture of yourself, dear friend. If you're in Christ this morning, if you're a believer, you're one of God's adopted children. You're part of his family. And in the same way that your family will always be your family, no matter how foolish they might be. As a child of God, you are always his child. I do hope you remember things like Romans, not like Hebrews, where it tells us whom the Father loves, he chastens. But that's a whole other subject. My point this morning is, you see, that as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You do have to be careful here. This is not talking about water baptism. This is talking about spirit baptism. And it's a, a frequent metaphor in the New Testament where we're told that we were immersed in Christ. And it's a beautiful picture that way. Water baptism pictures it very well. And as a believer, when you come to faith in Christ, you go through water baptism to declare to the world that you've left all that behind and you're now a child of God living for God. But let's go back to the, back, to the metaphor. We were placed into Christ. And in Christ, we are now God's holy, righteous people. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Grasp that. It's a verse which is misused today by certain groups. We'll not go down that road. But you go back and read it in 1 Corinthians 12. And what you will find is he's talking about the people of God. And he's saying that the single Holy Spirit has brought every Christian into the community of the people of God. The one body. And then see the link with what we'll read in a minute in Galatians. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. All of us have been brought in to the kingdom of God and are now clothed with Christ. So that, like, like the wedding garment in Jesus' parables, when you have it on, you can stay at the feast. But without it, you're thrown out. Christ is who God sees when he looks at me. And similarly, into the life of every believer. It was interesting to read as I was studying this, that in, in Roman society, they had a, a ritual which this might be alluding to. And... The, the, the ritual was for young boys moving from childhood into adulthood. What they did was in this ritual, they would take off their child's toga and put on an adult toga. And from that minute on, they were an adult. They would still have a lot of growing and learning to do, but they were an adult. And that's where you are, dear friend, a full citizen. In the kingdom of God. Just like the prodigal son. You've come home. Wondering what the father's going to say. And there he is out looking for you. What a lovely picture of God's grace and mercy. And like the prodigal. You might want to come back and say. Oh Lord I don't deserve your favour. Just let me be one of your lowest servants. And lo and behold. You hear the father saying. Bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. That's who I am as a Christian. That's what God has done for me in Christ. So that when he looks upon me, he sees me in his beloved son. Let it penetrate your thinking. Until you can repeat it for yourself with the confidence that comes from God's word. Don't say it because I'm telling you to. Take verses 26 and 27. And recognize that these things are yours. For time and for eternity. Because our hope and confidence rests. 
solely, uniquely on the work of Christ. What he's done, what he's presently doing, ever living to make intercession for us. And thereby refuse every kind of novelty that comes along. Whereby they say, if you really want to be a Christian, you need to do this as well. I've lived through the 1970s and 1980s and I've seen some weird things come and go. You remember when the Toronto blessing was everybody's passion? Where is it? I don't want to name too many things because I, I seek to be gracious. You think in your own mind. What have you been persuaded to believe that you needed to add to faith in Christ to make you a true Christian? There are some parts of the church where they tell you you, you you can receive Jesus as your saviour, but then you need to go through our discipleship course to make you a Christian. Uh -uh. I do need to be discipled. But coming to faith in Christ makes me immediately at that point in time a child of God. And as I'll seek to show you if I'm allowed for time, one who has an inheritance with Christ forever. Nobody can take it away from me. I can't even throw it away from myself. But I'll come to that. When you read this and you understand this concept, you can then understand why Paul has been so passionate in bringing these people back to the gospel. It might have seemed like good common sense, you know. Christianity it came out with Judaism. If you just came in as a Christian, you've missed the Judaism part. Get the Judaism part and everything will be how it should be. And nobody knew better than the Apostle Paul that that was wrong. Remember, a Jewish scholar, passionate for Judaism... And one day he learned that it had been fulfilled. It had come to its climax, to its end in Christ. And that God was now drawing out his own people from everywhere in the world. And that's the gospel we need to communicate to the unbeliever. But I meet God. Although I may well yet be overwhelmed with the awe and the majesty, there'll be no knee knocking. Because I'm not standing there on the basis of who I am or what I've done. I'm standing there in Christ. And so I need to ask the unbeliever, when you meet God, and let's be quite plain, you will meet him. Your knees won't just be knocking, they'll have gone to jelly. Because you'll realize that that gospel you had no time for was true. And that you could have been. Surely that must be the wrenching heart of many in hell today. I could have been. But I decided I'd rather have. Oh dear friends, make sure you're in Christ. Let me take you on and show you how Paul drives this home. That all Christians have the same standing before God. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you, I can imagine him pointing the finger, for you, are all one in Christ Jesus. Notice the in Christ Jesus again. And what he's doing is here, he's, he's, he's laying a, a level playing field for the church. He's saying to these Christians, no matter what your ethnic background, no matter what your gender, no matter what your social standing is, if you come to faith in Christ, you've now entered in as heirs of the promises that God gave his son. That he would have a people which no man can number, which would be his bride for all eternity. And the qualification is, you see, that you are in Christ. You've come to him. You've confessed him as your Savior and Lord. You've, you've said, I, 
I trust what he's done as my substitute. I believe that he's paid my bill. And I'm depending on him. The Holy Spirit has brought you to that place. Remember, I asked you just a week or so ago if you knew your name by nature. I hope you're saying sinner. It's marvelous, isn't it, in the New Testament that we're called saints. We have a distorted picture of saints, don't we, of these incredible beings who even after they're dead can do miracles. That's not a biblical picture. The biblical picture of a saint is somebody, simply somebody who's standing in Christ and has his righteousness. And for all the problems in the churches in the New Testament, almost all of Paul's letters begin by being written to the saints. They were a troubled bunch. But that's who we are in Christ. And you can become a saint. You have become a saint by simply bowing the knee to Jesus. Psalm 2 verse 12. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Revelation 6.15 and the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and the rocks of the mountains and said, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? You're either in Christ and you are enjoying the benefits. Or when you meet him. You will be like these kings of the earth. And everybody else that's listed here. You've believed in Jesus. And you've been delivered from the wrath of God. You now have an, inher an eternal inheritance. Let's look at the verse just for a little bit further. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor nor female. This is a, a regular theme in the New Testament. First Corinthians 12, I've already read to you. Colossians 3.10 You have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. For our present purpose, it's important to recognize that the Jews in particular drew a, a sharp line of separation between themselves and the rest of the world. They looked on the Gentiles as dogs. That's not that pet that you've got in the living room. A dog in the first century was a scavenger disease bearing and that's how they looked on the outsiders and I was told in one of my books that even when people became Jews as proselytes they went through circumcision they would be baptized and they would be declared to be Jews worshippers of the true God they were never fully accepted as real children of Abraham but here's the glory of the gospel there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. You're all, all, all one in Christ Jesus. It is true to, and important to observe here that within the church there are different gifts and roles and functions. But none of those gifts, roles or functions makes any individual believer more important or significant before God than another. And really and truly, if somebody has a gift from God and they understands that gift, it should be used in humility. You are all one in Christ Jesus, joined together in his body, the church, universal, expressed in local congregations, sharing the same spiritual life. 
enjoying the same relationship with God. It was clearly a big issue in the first century, and it has been down through the centuries. Listen to Paul writing to the Ephesians, chapter 2. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinance, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. He's talking about Jew versus Gentile. What Christ has accomplished has brought about an amazing transformation. In ancient Israel, the priests had to be Jews. They had to be free. They had to be males. But what you find in the gospel is that every believing child of God is now a priest unto God. Where would I get such an idea? First Peter chapter 2. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. The church, those who have faith in Christ, are looked upon as God's own people, his holy nation. All of us, one in Christ. What a tragedy then when we divide over secondary issues, when we make secondary issues primary issues. What a challenge to understand, to love, and to work with those true believers who are in a completely different Christian environment to ourselves. But that's the work that God's given you. One of my delights about going on holiday is going to a different church. And it's always a joy to see how you're welcomed. We try and do the same here when people come to worship with us from all over the world. You remember last year we had a family from India? I couldn't believe that, that they would have... Anyway, that's another story. All over the world, one in Christ. And as you get to know them, there'll be some things that you might think odd or even eccentric. But if they're in Christ, that's your brother and sister. If they're in Christ, you're his people. If they're in Christ, it then becomes vitally important that we encourage each other. That we live with the small differences. Because they are small in comparison to being in Christ. It is important that we work at making sure the gospel is preached. The tragedy in this century is that many of the places that were once gospel preaching churches have stopped preaching the gospel. You have to travel miles to find anybody saying the kind of things I try to say. There's a story told about a small English village that had a little chapel and it used to have outside, apparently, we preach Christ crucified. The story goes on. Times changed. Ivy grew and pretty soon the last word was covered. And so it was, we preach Christ. As the years went on, the ivy grew further until you could only see, we preach. And I'm afraid that's where many Christian Organizations have ended up today. You'll hear a great deal about how you should be a better person, how you should help your neighbor, how you should, and they'll give you this long list. What they're doing is what Paul is struggling against with the Galatians. Get into Christ and stay in Him and love the gospel. Let me get to my last point. Look at verse 29. This is mind-blowing. At least it's blowing mine. And if you are Christ's, that's not to cast doubt on it, that's because you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. A 
have sort of given this away already, but I'm going to persist in going through it, you see. We are heirs with Christ and Abraham of God's eternal purpose to have a world where righteousness is normal. To have a world where there's no more sin and wickedness. We get just a, a momentary glimpse of it in the Garden of Eden before Adam and Eve fell. But let me rest assured, let me rest, help you to rest assured that that's how the Bible finishes up. The last chapters of the book of Revelation are describing a reinstitution of the Garden of Eden. A world in harmony with God and where people are in harmony with God and one another. That's what Abraham was looking forward to. Do you remember these words from Hebrews 11 verse 9? By faith he dwelt in the land of promise. That's Israel as it is today or Palestine or however you want to define it. As in a foreign country. Dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Why did he do that? Hebrews 11.10. For he waited for the city which, was, which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. What Hebrews tells us, and very helpfully tells us, is that for all the promises about territory and land given to Abraham and his descendants... Abraham understood that he was looking for something beyond that. And so when you come to the New Testament, what you find is that God has brought together a new people from the Jews and from the Gentiles. They are his own people and we have this eternal promise. I realize where I'm going is quite controversial. And even here and now, some people might be pulling their hair out. But I put it to you, that's what this passage is teaching. If you are Christ's, that's every Christian, then you are Abraham's seed. We are the people to whom those promises were made, and especially that promise of Christ. And as Abraham's seed, we are heirs according to the promise. Earlier on in this chapter, we're told that the promise was not to the individual people down through history, but it was to Christ. And that God's promise to Christ is where my focus is to be, and it's who I'm called to take my interest in. If you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's true children. And heirs together with him. Called out of every tribe and tongue and nation across the planet. Possessing an area of the globe which is far bigger than a country in the Middle East. And one day to possess the whole thing. I'm a wee bit nervous of even approaching this subject, but I can't avoid what the scriptures say. The Jews are included, but they're included as part of the church. Romans 9, 8. Those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. And if you know Romans 9 to 11, you know the subject is Israel. But the children of promise are counted as the seed. And as Paul goes through that, those three chapters, there's a lot of twists and turns. He has to finally deal with, well, what about Israel? And you get it in chapter 11, verses 11 and 12. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, if their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? And if you take time to read that passage, he talks about Jewish people being grafted back in. So that there's one body in the world. I find great difficulty with with, with the concept that God has two purposes, one for the, the, those descended from Abraham and one for the rest of us. In fact, as I read history and theology, I know that was invented in the 1820s by John Nelson Darby. 
and promoted in the 20th century by C.I. Schofield. And it has taken off. Reading verses like this brings me back to see that God has one purpose, a bride for his son. And that that bride is made up of believers from every ethnic background. The Jews did have a special place in God's sight. And because of that, they've been preserved down through history. And I look for the day when they look on him whom they have pierced and they mourn and they flee to Christ and they are included with the people of God, which is the church. It's the main point of Paul's argument. Remember? These Jews were saying, you need to become like us. And Paul's saying, no way. We are the people of God. And there's nothing to be added to that. We are God's children. We are the possessors of all the promises that were given. And we are therefore safe and secure. And this applies whether you're male or female, Jew, Greek, slave or free. My time's gone. I'd love to have expanded that further. But please understand it covers every aspect of society then and now. In my 50 years as a Christian, I've met all kinds of different people who are Christians. Some of them very powerful, rich and intelligent. Some of them very ordinary. If you'd ever met my mother, it was a delight she came to faith in Christ, but that woman hardly read any books in her whole lifetime. But she loved the Lord. And you'll know people like that. And that's what qualifies a Christian. Am I in Christ? Am I resting there? Then the promises of God are mine. And that's what I need to recommend to every Unbeliever, I came across this intriguing little statement from Harry S. Truman, who I think was one of the U.S. presidents in the past. When he was speaking, he says, there's a small wooden bird called the flugy bird. I'd never heard of it. Around the flugy bird's neck is a label reading, I fly backwards. I don't care where I'm going. I just want to see where I've been. That's the unbeliever. I care where you're going. And many of us do. And we want you in Christ with us forever. Why won't you come? And be part of God's own people. And Christian, are you enjoying being one of God's own people? Why should the children of a king go mourning all their day? We should go through life allowing for its ups and downs because they do come without invitation. We should be going through life with a quiet, humble confidence that because God is for us, it does not matter who's against us. May God give you that grace. A word from Lloyd Jones to finish. The devil's one object is to so depress God's people that he can go to the man of the world and say, There are God's people. Do you want to be like that? Let's seek the Holy Spirit to apply what we've been reading to our lives, that we might go on in the joy that's our inheritance. Amen. We're going to close this morning by rejoicing in the grace of God. 504 in your hymn book. Sovereign grace or sin abounding. Even that's a fabulous line. Ransom souls the tidings swell. Tis a deep that knows no sounding. Who its breadth or length can tell. On its glories let my soul forever. Notice that. On its glories let my soul forever dwell. This is what should be filling our minds and it's the key 
to living and enjoying the grace of God. 504. so gracious Lord we humble ourselves before you me a child of God thank you Lord that this is true because of who Christ is and what he's accomplished and what he has guaranteed may I enjoy the power of it this day and every day this next week in Jesus name Amen, Amen.